This is CK. Uh, I'm going to tell you about uh, some black hole uh, your research. Now, because the, the background of you know, this group of people seems to be quite diverse, so I will start with some really, really simple uh, background on, uh, on black hole. So you know, the, the whole reason we are interested in, in black hole is to study uh, gravity. And it turns out that Einstein's general theory of relativity is still our best theory to describe gravity. And you know, he actually described that gravity is not a force. Instead, it's a consequence of that your space-time can be curved. So I have a little uh, animation here that you know, when there's no heavy object around, then you know, the space-time is flat. And then particles, photons, or whatever, they will just move in straight line like uh, what's in the animation now. now. However, if you have some uh, heavy, dense object like a star, like a black hole that curves the space-time, then even though the particles and photons want to move in the most strict uh, your possible line, because the space-time itself is curved, so they will end up you know, curving uh, in, in their orbits. So John Wheeler uh, gave a very good uh, quote on this. If, you know, General relativity pretty much say space-time tells matter how to move and matter tells space-time how to curve. And you know, this is not just a, a idea, this is very well tested. There are a lot of tests on general relativity, mainly in the solar system. However, uh, you know, we don't really know if the theory is still valid when we go to very dense uh, object. And you know, if you just look at the theory itself, uh, there is a very interesting prediction that if you put uh, enough matter in a small region, you can curve space-time so much that all the light cone will point toward a central singularity. So uh, on the left here, this is a, you know, actually a graph from a very old textbook. So these are the, the light cone, uh, the cone pointing on the top. That's your future. So the idea around black hole is you know, once you pass this surface called the UN horizon, the, all of your future actually point inside the black hole. There's no way for you to escape. And if such an object exists, then you can you know, consider for experiment that you have this you know, black hole and you shine a flashlight onto it. And if you do that because the, the space time is so curved, that even night, you know, some of the these rays will actually orbit around black hole, and some of them will go back to you. So when you look at this object, you will see a very bright uh, ring uh, coming back. So this is the observation signature that you know, many of us astronomers want to uh, capture. So in order to do this, uh, you know, part of my research is with the Event Horizon Telescope. So this is a collaboration of more than 200 uh, members all around the world that we use multiple telescopes uh, trying to capture this event horizon uh, and this photon ring that I, I showed you earlier. So in 2017, uh, we used uh, eight telescopes all around the world to form a big array. And in 2018, in the coming year, we will be using 12 different telescopes. Uh, I won't go into the detail of the observation uh, technology, you know, even though I, I actually spend most of my time in the last few years working on the data. But yeah, this is a GPU talk, so I'll just go through uh, you know, very quickly the, the data pathway, and then I will jump back to the, the simulation path that we use the GPU. So when we take the ob observation, we actually record the radio waveform from the black hole. So uh, the data rate was, was very big, and within a week, we actually fill up five petabytes of data. And because we have a telescope at the South Pole, it's you know, po not possible to, to transfer the data through the internet. So we actually physically uh, you know, ship this hardest to our uh, data centers. So these are just a couple of pictures, and this is our your physical library of data. And at our data center, we have a step called correlation. What that does is to remove the noise from this five petabyte of data, reduce the data volume by a factor of thousand. And then we end up with about five uh, terabyte of uh, actual data that can be used. And then there's another step called fringe fitting that we remove the systematic uh, from the data set. And that reduce the data 
by another 10,000 uh, times. And after that, we will work with a small data set and we can finally apply our feature extraction imaging tally to get the science out. And we can also reconstruct the, the black hole image. So you know, this is a your F of a large collaboration. And from this image, there are actually a few interesting things. So at the center, you know, this dark part is the black hole shadow. So this is a you know, direct evidence that event horizon you know, actually exists and uh, general relativity is correct uh, you know, to the, you know, even in the regime of uh, strong gravity. And we have a ring. The, sh the fact that the shape of this ring is, is circular, it actually tells us something because different theory of gravity actually predict different shape of this photon ring. So uh, you know, with the, you know, just with this picture, you know, we can measure the shape and the agreement actually confirmed that uh, Einstein's general relativity is correct. And also the asymmetry uh, you know, in this ring also tell us the, how the plasma uh, move around, you know, around the black hole. So you know, this picture tells us a lot of information. But you know, in order to really connect this to theory, we need to uh, carry a lot of numerical simulations. So we actually have a simula uh, simulation library and we use these models to compare with the ob observation. And then, and then and then we can extract the, the physical parameter that we're interested in. Okay, so in order to simulate this black hole image, there are two major steps. One is called general relativistic magnetohydrodynamic. So this step, we pretty much just follow the plasma around the black hole. Uh, and then we follow the turbulence for we study the dynamics of uh, this plasma. Now, I won't be talking about this, you know, although there are actually GPU accelerate GLMHT code out there, that's actually not my expertise. Uh, my work is mainly about the next step that's called general relativistic ray chasing. The idea is we want to follow photons in this you know, curved space time in the Christian fold. So this following uh, graphic actually describes pretty well. So we set up a grid of photons. And at each pixel, we just trace the ray back to the GLMHD simulation. This you know, uh, colorful uh, volume rendering here, this is the GLMHD simulation that you know, my colleague did. And then we perform this ray tracing calculation, integrate the radiative transfer equation along the ray to get the final image. So this is a problem that you know, uh, many people have solved. You know, I'm not the first one who, who did that. Uh, but many of the, the previous study, uh, you know, they are done in, in CPU. And I'm actually the first one who, who solved this problem on GPU. And this is a benchmark uh, from our first paper that we show just doing things on GPU without too much optimization. It's already a factor of 30 faster than existing uh, CPU codes. And you can see there is th uh, this flattening here. This is the you pretty much the startup time of your kernel. If you're solving a small number of photons, then just to launch kernel will take most of the time. But if you are solving many, many photons uh, in your image, then eventually the GPU win and become faster. But you know, there are actually a little bit of detail go into this speed up. In order to get a 30 times speed up, we need to do everything in single precision flow. Usually that's a bad idea in radiative transfer because you have this crazy constant that is you know, very, very big. And dividing, multiplying them will give you your know, either NAN or zeros. So uh, when we develop the kernel, we were actually you know, quite careful and we manually regroup the terms so that all the variable we save as a, a single precision flow that turn out to be, you have a range that is within the, the your allowed range of floating point. So after you do this you know, kind of careful rearrangement, then single precision actually work very well for way chasing. And a typical uh, image movie will actually look like this. So this is now a movie of this uh, general relativistic ray chasing calculation. Uh, you know, this is a three color channel image. Red is some long radio, green is optical, and blue is X-ray. And here I'm swinging the, the camera so you can see things uh, you know, around the plot. So uh, this vertical part here, this is the funnel or the jet of the Christian flow. 
and then this other part they are the infolding plasma and you can also see a ring uh, a very thin ring here this is the ring that I, I said at the very beginning that you know, some photon actually will turn back to you and once in a while you can also see some your know, bright flux tube uh, showing up in this movie so that corresponds to uh, magnetic reconnection you know, just that we went so this turns out to be you know, still the you know, one of the leading explanation of why you know, we observe some of the variability from black holes and uh, this is another you know, just eye candy animation showing you that uh, the black hole actually looks different at different wavelengths so let me try to move back to the beginning so in a very long uh, wavelength uh, say radio the plasma around the black hole is optically thick so you cannot see the black hole all you see is the plasma around it but when you move to uh, shorter wavelength higher frequency all of a sudden the plasma become transparent and you can finally see the, the middle black hole okay so at the end of this movie this is 1.3 millimeter wavelength so this is exactly the frequency that the EHT observed the black hole so this kind of your know, simulation uh, they are not just useful in uh, comparing the observation with you know, with model but they are very also you know, they are also very useful in predicting how the black hole will look like and help us design our experiment now this is another movie so uh, in the 2017 data we captured uh, the M87 uh, black hole so this is your know, our curve one uh, your know, simulation with all the fit parameter so we actually believe this is you know if we have much higher resolution this is how M87 would look like all right so uh, M87 is only one of the main black holes that we are observing uh, we are also interested in the uh, black hole at the center of the Milky Way uh, the Sagittarius star and for that black hole is much well studied there are a lot of different observations uh, including your X-ray different frequency so we are able to use those information to constrain model this is a spectrum you again actually calculate by a GL ray chasing uh, calculation so we can use the X-ray flux to constrain our model we then use some uh, your other wavelength and then we've used the 1.3 millimeter uh, size observed by the EHT and then we also use the optical to make constraint so uh, you know, before the EHT collaboration form this is actually the biggest uh, study we had because of the GPU code even though each single calculation is quite short we are able, you know, with the acceleration we are able to run millions of image and form a re really big image library and by you know by comparing this image and library with all the different constraints we you know we are able to come up with five best fit model so the EHT is still working on the Sergio image but you know these are the five possibility that how how Sergio will, will look like now I mentioned earlier that different uh, gravity of three we will give you different prediction of the shadow uh, size so this is also something uh, some science we can do with uh, general relativistic ray chasing and you know finally uh, you know, in addition once we get the, the parameters we can ask uh, you know the ray chasing algorithm again to actually compute a whole time series of simulation and then we can start you know, predicting the variability of, of these different models so this is a, you know, again a, a movie showing such a model the left two panels here these are the radio wavelength this is the 1.3 millimeter optical and on the right the blue channel that is the, the x-ray and uh, you know the lower panel here shows the light curve how this uh, different wavelength vary and you know if you you look at the, the image once a while again you form you can see this very bright uh, flux tube showing up so again these are the you know, some of the explanation of why we are seeing flares in in these black holes okay so uh, you know, I know this is GPU for science but GPU is about graphics so you know, our group also uh, you know, use GPU to do visualization we actually develop a uh, a software using Oculus Rift 
actually not the Microsoft HoloLens. So we, we have a virtual reality visualization tool to uh, overlay this GLMHD simulation and the GLLT simulation so that we can map the features we see in this GL calculation back to the features in the, uh, in the GLMHD simulation. So that is very helpful in understand what's going on in, in these calculations. Okay, so I guess I, I, you know, I'm short in time. So let me just go through some, you know, some recent development. The, the, the code I showed you earlier that, you, that was done in uh, CUDA, uh, but our new development, we are, we are switching to OpenCL. And we are also changing coordinate. It turns out that you know, in general relativity, the coordinate is, uh, is free. You can get the same physics with a different coordinate. So we use something called the Kirchhoff coordinate. Usually that's considered more expensive uh, computationally, uh, more expensive coordinate. But we work out some symmetry in the equation and we find our formula sum to simplify that so that you know, the number of operations is not that much higher than the boiling crystal coordinate. But because Kirchhoff is Cartesian, so now we can get rid of all the coordinate singularity in the previous code. And this is a benchmark of our new code. So on single precision, this is your know, super fast. It's 0.1 nanosecond per photon step. Uh, but even in double precision, you can see the, the Kirchhoff coordinate, our singularity is free uh, formula sum. It can be even faster than, than the standard formula sum that other people use. And uh, these are some convergence tests. And again, I want to highlight that you know, the change of coordinate, even though the computation is more expensive, you get rid of the singularity and you, our way can just go through the poll without any problem. And uh, you know, finally, let me just tell people that uh, your auto ray tracing itself is quite simple. You, you know, it is a foundation for some other interesting work. So when I say ray tracing, this is actually very different from you know, what the industry called ray tracing because we are just integrating ODE, so the rays, they don't really you know, scatter around. Now, however, you know, with the, the new uh, NVIDIA uh, your turning and, and ambient uh, architecture, you know, the industry is moving to, to ray tracing graphics. But those calculations actually correspond to scattering uh, in, in, uh, in our calculation. So uh, something we are going to do now is to you know, turn our engine to, to do something that, that's able to handle scattering. And we are also working on particle-based dryokinetics. So this great figure here is just showing you some of the particle trajectory of this uh, your dryokinetic calculations. And we are also working on doing a radiation GLMHD calculation. So this is combining the ray tracing work that I show you with the GLMHD. So what we want is to do uh, all the GLMHD cal calculation on the CPU, but let the GPU handle the, the uh, radiation. And also this GV2 code that I, I described, it actually built on a library called Lux and Lux uh, is able to uh, measure the performance at runtime and uh, and you just re-architect your algorithm. So this is something that uh, we are currently working on. And uh, and that's it. So I, I guess you know, if there's time, I can take some questions. Uh, thank you very much, Chi Kuan. That was a very beautiful uh, presentation with all the animations and everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have a question. I think that was partially answered by you or maybe mostly. Uh, for the other ray tracing. Okay, we have another one, I think. Yeah, so can you comment? Mm -hmm. So, so is uh, that the Q and A that you are talking about, or is that? I uh, know. So there was one in chat. It was about ray tracing. I think you just answered that in the second last slide. Uh, so there is one in Q and A. It's, uh, I think you can see that. Can you comment on the operating system, hardware, software platform, and details of the VR visualization stack? Very interested in using VR for three D database. Yeah, so that that's you know, very, very interesting. So when when we first did that uh, virtual reality thing, we we actually used the Oculus development kit, 
and that was the time that Oculus still still support Mac. So we did all the development uh, on the Mac with the Oculus SDK, uh, you know, with OpenGL. But some of the latest development we we are doing now is we turn this whole GL way cal tracing calculation into a library. So when I say G way two, it's actually not a uh, your standard program. It's just a library, and we are planning to uh you know, interface this library with Unity so that you can do most of your your virtual reality stuff in Unity, but then you call the function from G way two to do the scientific calculation. All right. Uh, I think we have a couple of questions uh, more. And uh, so one is from uh, Hugo. Hugo, you can unmute yourself and go ahead and ask the question. Please. Yeah, this was just a question about the FPS32 computation you decided to make uh, thanks to the interval of computation of uh, your floating points. So that uh, you were actually able to, to do the computation inside of the FPS32 range. Um, did you find it like by doing interval analysis with a specific tool or did you do it by hand? How did you make sure that it was always in that interval for any input data? Yeah, so you know, we, we were lucky enough to have some uh, your Tesla GPU background. And when we first did the development, uh, the development was done in uh, double precision. But then uh, we you know, we type that our our double and four to to another type called real, and then we can just we changing a single line we can change from double position to to single position, and at the beginning we just saw you know, the result become incorrect you know, we start to get N A N and four, uh, and zero, uh, after we switch from double to to single, and then we just do, uh you know, manually go into the code and figure out which part of the code go crazy. And then we, we find out is you know, mostly the radioactive transfer uh, calculation. And then we start you know, manually recombining and, and you know, tuning those terms and then you work out. Uh, but you know, we didn't do anything fancy, it's a manual uh, process. So how do you make sure that uh, the results will be in the right range for any input? Yeah, so uh, you know, to be honest, this is not valid for all inputs. But when we talk about this accretion black hole, uh, you know, there is a range of their density, their range of their luminosity. So we know within the range, inch, uh, within the range that we are interested, they they fall into the, the range. So actually, let me go back to the, the slide side. So we could say that you made the uh, interval analysis uh, by hand, yeah? Yeah, so, so if you look at um, this slide here, so we have actually have some comments in our code showing within the range that we are interested, what is the typical value of this parameter and what is the range of these different things. So you know, again, everything is done manually, uh, but you know, we just find this very, very uh, useful because it allows us to turn a double precision calculation into a single precision. Nice, thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have another question from the organizer, but before we go towards that, uh, there's a small announcement. Uh, we have a tutorial on OpenACC starting in about 15 minutes. And the tutorial uh, will take place in the breakout room, the other Zoom link that we have. I think it will be going up in the chat shortly, or if you're in the Slack channel, or you might have received the email as well. So if you're registered for the tutorial, please start uh, queuing up there and you can start testing out your accounts. There will be some experts there to help you out. and. Uh, Anyone else interested in this question on the session, they can stay here. So I think Ashin has uh, a few questions. Ashin, go ahead. Hi there. Um, I was just wondering if you would comment on the relative value of physical transfer of data um, from remote locations to um, either the investment in infrastructure to bring the data out or um, some sort of local processing, maybe using something like GPUs. Oh, so uh, I guess you are referring to the um, to the observation part of my project instead of the ray tracing calculation. Uh, yeah, a little bit. Um, well, it's more the so the observation was done at a variety of pretty remote sites, 
And you said it talked about having to physically transport the data as in your hard drives in a presumably being Antarctica, a ship or a plane. And um, I was just wondering, was there consideration given, given to putting a processing center or something like that um, close to the instrument rather than moving the data? Yeah, so, so this is a very good comment. So it turns out that uh, you know, because the, the signal is very weak. So what we are observing, most of them are noise. And then you know, the, the, the step we use to, to combine the data is just a correlation. And then the correlation is to be done on you know, between each station pair. So you, know, you can't really just pre-process the data at the station and reduce the data size. Uh, you know, so, so that's the reason we have to ship all the data uh, to, to our data center. Now, having said that, uh, you know, the EHC does use a very high bandwidth and we do have uh, you know, some very sensitive uh, station. So in the future, it's actually possible to pre-process in the sense that we reduce the bandwidth, uh, you record, reduce the, the recording uh, bandwidth. And once we do that, we can you know, reduce the data by, by a factor of 10 or so. But you know, we, even with that, it's just faster to, to you know, ship or, or send the data through airplane. But you know, definitely uh, you know, putting, uh, putting computation near the observation actually make a lot of sense for, for many applications. Uh, but for VLBI, it's, you know, it's a little bit more complicated. <laughs>